you, Melissa. Thank you, Raleigh. Um, so my name is Melissa Hannum. Uh, I work at a center called the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. Uh, the thing we are trying to not proliferate are weapons of mass destruction and their delivery devices. So these are nuclear, chemical, biological weapons, and then things like missiles, um, bombers, and aerial vehicles that could deliver them. Um, my professional career coincided with the start of Google Earth, <laughs> magically. And at the time, I was working for a different um, NGO in Seoul uh, called International Crisis Group. And it was not possible for me to travel to North Korea. It was not possible for me to get very much information about North Korea. So I had heard of this new thing called Google Earth. And, and after a missile launch, um, I decided to go looking. Uh, and I actually found the missile on the pad. So my first impression of Google Earth was that it was magic and it would just show you <laughs> what you wanted to find. And I've sort of been a, a convert ever since. Um, one of the things that I really like about Google Earth is that it's an equalizer. Uh, it used to be that only the US and the Soviet Union could show you what the planet looked like. And if they wanted to tell you what the planet looked like, you had to believe them. Now anyone can look at the planet and they can make informed decisions about the planet. Commercial satellite imagery is becoming cheaper, but Google Earth really led the way. I still use Google Earth. Um, in 2015, I found this facility, uh, which it was purportedly for making bio pesticides. Uh, these are like organic pesticides called Bacillus thuringiensis or BT. You can buy it in Home Depot or your local hardware store. Um, but the facility is of such large scale, uh, included so much equipment that would have been prohibited that it is very likely that this is North Korea's anthrax facility. Uh, Bacillus thuringiensis is the cousin of Bacillus anthracis, which is the bacteria that causes anthrax. Um, I found this facility on Google Earth because I didn't know where to start looking and I didn't I couldn't purchase an infinite amount of satellite imagery in order to find it. So it was, it was using information I had about the facility when Kim Jong-un visited it, and then narrowing in on, where, on its location, and then being extremely lucky that there was historical imagery over this facility. Um, I could see where they had added a power supply uh, so that they would have uninterrupted power because you don't want your industrial cell line to go down and kill off all the bacteria. I could even see when they installed these tanks, this really heavy duty ventilation system. I could see when they remodeled the labs, um, all the construction process was recorded, luckily, or spookily. <laughs> and so I could find this and I could um, you know, present some information about this. Um, North Korea did not like this. <laughs> and uh, they call me riffraff and a trickster. So while, <laughs> while I am able to share information, one problem I still continuously run up against is nobody, people want to believe what they want to believe. And fortunately, not too many people want to believe North Korea. But when it comes to me finding stuff in Russia, I got a whole new problem of people who don't want to believe what their own eyes are telling them. And misinformation and fake news is a real thing that really affects us. So that is still one of the challenges. The other thing I really like about Google Earth is that it's round. I cannot tell you how many helpful gentlemen on the internet have sent me maps trying to explain to me that this missile could only go a thousand kilometers and drawing a straight line across the Earth. And thanks to Google Earth, I can say, oh, oh, oh no, 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 a thousand across the range is just this. They're launching this thing way up into the atmosphere. Uh, at this time, it was because they did not want to fly over Japan. Um, th but they were trying to practice that level of um, range. But I could collect some information about the apogee, the, the, the range across uh, the Earth, and the time it took to flew, the location it flew from. Uh, I'll show you how I measure all about missiles. 
And then um, I'm able to sort of kick some of this information out into Google Earth and show what a trajectory might look like if it was using a, what we call an energy conserving trajectory. A lot of the work I do is collaborative. So I'm working with um, physicists, people who understand satellite imagery, people who understand ballistic missile defense. We're all compiling data into sheets because we can collaborate. Um, we can't feed this directly into Google Earth yet. Um, so what we're doing is we collect all this information based on, so my job is usually measuring things in photos and in videos to understand the thrust and the, the diameter and the length of all, all, the, all the parts of the missile. Um, but once we collect all that information, we can actually put it into MATLAB, and then we can use um, a model that shows the rotation of the Earth, the decrease of the weight of the missile as it takes off and burns fuel, as it drops a stage off and the second stage ignites. All these things can kind of be accounted for, and then I can kick it back in to make that visualization I showed you. A lot of times we need to do things fast. The very last intermediate range ballistic missile they did, I was driving a rental car to the Denver airport. Um, this is, uh, I decided not to include the video <laughs> because it was too annoying, but it's sort of low res. This is my colleague in the car uh, listening to uh, Biggie Smalls uh, while on his phone holding up Google Earth and pointing with his finger where the missile went. And that was because my other colleague in the other car was on the phone with CNN trying to explain that this missile went over Japan, not you know next to Japan or near Japan, it went over Japan. And so what we were visualizing while I was driving <laughs> was this is all happening in a car and it has to happen fast, um, particularly because in this missile launch, it was the first time that even academics started suggesting that perhaps the US should strike North Korea's missile on the pad. The other thing we were trying to express very quickly was that North Korea launched this from their international airport. This is uh, not a military facility strictly, this is an international airport, and a flight flying to Beijing was actually leaving a little over an hour later. So it's a very bad idea to launch it on the pad here. <laughs> if you have a plane full of Chinese people trying to get home. Um, the other thing we do a lot, or we used to do a lot of, is getting propaganda videos and photos out of YouTube. YouTube just shut this down a few weeks ago because they want to be compliant with US laws and sanctions, and I respect and understand that. It is very much harder for me now to do research on the subject. Uh, and probably it means, like just in this case as well, uh, we'll go to Tudo, which is the Chinese competitor to YouTube. Um, but in this case, what we often do is North Korea puts out propaganda and we look for useful stuff. And uh, one of the challenges we have with submarine launched ballistic missiles is that there's nothing that gives me a sense of scale to know how big it is. And out of dozens of photos that were published, this one had a boat in it. So not me, my colleague found the boat on Google Earth, geolocated it in the nearest port. And then we could take the mensuration tool and we could measure the boat and we could make not just a ratio of length to diameter of the missile, but we could actually get a sense of, not, not perfectly, just very approximately, because you know the registration of the Google Maps and also the, the heading of the boat in the optics of the camera, there's a lot of error. But we could say that this is similar enough to a Soviet-made um, engine and submarine launched ballistic missile that we could get a really good sense of what this was. We can also make 3D models of it. And this exercise is mostly funded by uh, an organization that wants to educate the public, but the process of making these models means that we become really intimately familiar with the models themselves. So by doing this really quite painstaking work uh, with, with grad students, we can actually see where the weld lines are on the missile, and it gives us information about how big the fuel and oxidizer tanks inside the missile are, 
And because the fuel burns at a known rate and the ratio of the fuel to the oxidizer can be measured, we actually can get a pretty good idea of how far that missile will go. And we can also learn a lot about the weight, um, the likelihood for it to spin or, or, or go in a direction you wouldn't expect. And it also helps us weed out the propaganda photos that are real and the propaganda photos that are not real, <laughs> which is another problem with North Korea. Um, whoops. One of my favorite things that we can do is uh, myth bust. So um, another challenge we face is um, there's a lot of controversy surrounding what is called popularly the Iran deal. Uh, so uh, US, uh, several states in Europe and China have agreed with Iran to a situation where Iran will freeze its nuclear program uh, that will be verified through very complex systems of regulations and inspections and procurement rules. And in exchange, the US and Europe and others will loosen their sanctions on Iran. Um, one of the challenges we have is that there are a lot of groups that want to announce that Iran is cheating. And we have to distinguish the times when Iran may actually be cheating and when they may not be cheating. So this was right before um, the Iran deal was concluded, uh, a group called the National Council for the Resistance of Iran, which if you pay attention to that name, you can get maybe they have a stake in this game, right? Um, announced that they had found evidence that Iran had a secret centrifuge enrichment facility in Tehran, the capital of Iran. And um, they put out very professional looking dossier explaining their findings. Indeed, they had uncovered secret nuclear facilities in Iran in the past. And so immediately, the media started grabbing onto all these things. And uh, the US State Department spokesperson, Victoria Newland, got tons of questions about this. And her response was, no comment. This caused even more concern from various media outlets all over the world. Could Iran be cheating on the Iran deal even before it happened? So we took the claims of uh, NCRI and we just put them to the Google Earth test. They made claims about heavy duty construction happening at this location. So we went through all the historical imagery and looked for evidence of dirt being moved around, of a construction equipment, of, um, of you know, facilities that might indicate um, heat or venting from underground. Uh, we looked at traffic patterns at this location, all because we had a nice stack of imagery because it's an urban area in downtown Tehran. We could also take measurements, and one of the most, one of the useful ones was the elevation data of this place. So the NCRI made the claim that because of the slope in this location, um, the, the secret facility had to go down 15 stories, is what they said. They had to dig down 15 stories underground. And then the facility was a, a pronged structure of four 40 meter long tunnels uh, with all the equipment in it. There are many other parts of this analysis that aren't specifically related to Google Earth, but this was really helpful because we found the slope was actually in the opposite direction that they said. Um, there was really no reason to dig 15 stories down here. In fact, it actually introduced a lot more risk into that kind of construction project um, into you know detection and other you know other sort of sort of it didn't meet the Occam's razor test. It just doesn't make sense to do it that way. Um, and if you're interested in this, I can show you um, some of the other pieces of it. One of the other really compelling things I maybe I should have put in was that we found on OpenStreetMap that a uh, German businessman. Um, visited Iran, and because he's like an exercise enthusiast, enthusiast he took tag uh, tracks on his phone. And so we were able to load those up in Google Earth, and because they're all time-stamped, we could also prove that there was absolutely no security at this facility. He could drive up in his car, he didn't get stopped, no one asked him to pull out his 
you know, passport or anything like that. And he drove right up to the secret facility and went in. And he was also able to tell us a lot about the kinds of things he did there, which were really legitimate. Because it turns out they make um, serialized notes like money and ID badges and passports here. That's what they do. Um, storytelling. So you often hear about Google Earth as a storytelling tool. Um, it helps me because uh, I already have a lot of information ready to go when something happens. And so this is PBS Nova, which is uh, one of the US's public information uh, channels, a very popular show. They can do an interview. They have all this prepackaged uh, data ready to go. And they love it because it means it's less work for them. And they're, they're not as worried about it being wrong because it's coming from a research center. And um, it means, I mean, it probably means I get picked more to go on these kinds of shows. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we do a lot of different types of media packages. This is one of the things that our funders really want. So we will do a combination of just B-roll, just silent. It'll just be like go to a place and orbit. And then we'll give information cards labeling everything there. But then the news organization can come back because uh, we make them with green screens. And then they can just put their own annotations and their own font or whatever. They can put their own logos on it. Um, they can annotate it however we want. So these are boring for regular people because they'll be like five or 12 minutes of just slowly orbiting a place. And then it's up to the video editor to chop it up and use it however they want. Some of these are, are, are 3D models. The other thing we do though is educational videos. And some of these have had over like 130,000 views. Um, this one is of Pakistan where, and I swear there is a Google logo, you just, just blocked by the, <laughs> I, I didn't, I followed licensing, I swear. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, we put out these educational, this is narrated, you can't hear it, but, you know, they're describing the place. Um, we used to do a lot more of this in the Google tour program, and but we always had it to video edit. And um, I don't know if you can tell in these, but we actually 3D model min many of these buildings because they aren't, um, they're not in an urban area, they're not already built. Um, and uh, so these get embedded on the Nuclear Threat Initiative's website. You can see their logo up there. Makes them so happy because out of all the content they have on their website, um, this content gets clicked the most and they can also track how many times it gets clicked on. So every year in October, when we renegotiate our, our grant with them, they take out all the analytics of their page clicks of all the videos, and they make decisions about how to refund us, or hopefully refund us. And um, it really helps us make the argument that um, you know, we're doing a good job and we're worth funding. Um, the other thing I do is uh, training, uh, like Steven. We're both in the trainers network for Google Earth Outreach, which is just a um, pretty informal group of people in NGOs and academia who uh, really know Google tools pretty well and they want to share it with communities. So because I'm based at a university, I do teach. And one of the things that we really focus on is Google Earth. I teach at a graduate school that is policy-based, not necessarily STEM. So a lot of the students are really nervous about doing this. And they don't know, they think it'll be hard. They're very cautious about it. And Google Earth is always the first thing I introduce because it's really empowering and it makes them feel ready to try other stuff later on. I actually do a whole bunch of Google tools. Um, we also have visiting diplomats. These are our current visiting diplomats. Um, we sort of fluctuate between four and 15 diplomats from around the world. So right now we have uh, someone from China, someone from Ethiopia, someone from Chile, and some people from Kazakhstan. But in the summers, we get like maybe 15 people, um, depending on which country the State Department is interested in, um, and helping them build their customs, um, their um, sort of knowledge about um, 
what are called dual use items. So items that could be used for civilian or military purposes and the flow of them into their countries or the flow of them out of their countries. So we do a lot of training on that. And, um, you know, I trained them on how to use these tools. One of my favorites was we had um, quite a senior gentleman from Nigeria and his job was to do um, nuclear security. And that is the physical protection of fissile material as it moves around your country for peaceful reasons. So if you get cancer treatment, if you have a research reactor, if you're irradiating food, you do have radiological sources in your country. Um, every country has radiological sources. They can be made into a dirty bomb. Um, and so because he was from Nigeria, he shared with me, um, probably shouldn't have, but he shared with me some of the transit routes that they use. And then I went and got the University of Maryland's terrorism database, and I showed him how different terrorist hijackings and attacks were evolving over time and suggested that he keep it in mind when he, when he planned the routes. And he uh, also found it really empowering because it meant he could go back to his superiors and really make the argument this isn't something we should sleep on, this is something we should take seriously. Okay, last slide. Um, sometimes in weapons of mass destruction, foreign policy, and tech, there are very few women. <laughs> and I also love that Google Earth lets me focus on the data and it does it in a really impactful way. So even when a bunch of old white guys have to listen to me and they're really distracted mostly because I'm pregnant with twins, that uh, I can still convey my message effectively. It's kind of like a safety blanket where I'm like, look at the data and stop asking me when I'm due, <laughs> stuff like that. So I also, I mean, it's hard to measure, but I find it really empowering as a woman that I can effectively deliver this information in a way that most people don't think I can. And I love that moment when people sort of like, oh, she knows what she's talking about. And Google Earth helps me do that. So thank you very much.